before I begin tonight, uh, Sister Betty Cobb, who was Brother Bob's uh, mother, uh, requested that I make mention of her uh, tonight at, during my spot. And I'd just like to tell you a little bit about her, you that uh, maybe don't know her real well, but uh, up until last Thursday, Sister Betty was all packed up and ready to come to the renewal. Uh, Sister Betty is, uh, undergoes uh, kidney dialysis treatments, and so that meant, means take, you know, bringing all the equipment. They, we had uh, the arrangement to take a, a day supply in one vehicle, and the rest of it was going to be in the Bruick's uh, uh, van. And, uh, but then uh, she found out that uh, her husband, uh, Brother Chuck, uh, had to have uh, some uh, a surgery that was uh, necessary to take care of right, right away. So, and anyhow, uh, Brother Chuck is kind of hanging in the balances, and uh, and Sister Betty, you know, uh, I'll tell you, I'd, I'd just like to give a tribute to Sister Betty at this time. You know, uh, she is always uh, at the assembly. In spite of uh, in spite of kidney dialysis treatments, Sister Betty is there. And she's at the morning service, the evening service. She drives what, 35, 40 miles from DeMott or however long that is. But she makes the trip all the way up to Crown Point uh, every, every Lord's Day twice. And usually on Tuesday nights, uh, she makes the trip, drives by herself most of the time. And sometimes when she's not feeling well, she has uh, someone else bring her. But uh, I think she's, uh, she deserves a tribute, uh, and, I, and I would like to uh, commend her to the Lord, and I'd like to remember her and Brother Chuck at this present time. Heavenly Father, we commit uh, Sister Betty Cobb to Thee and, the, and Brother Chuck, Lord, and we ask, uh, even in this very hour, Lord, that Thy mercies may be extended to both of them, Thy presence may be uh, uh, pres uh, presently uh, discerned by them, and, and that thy grace and help may be with them, Lord. We, we commit them to thee, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. <clears throat> About 30 years ago, I heard a, a quotation, and I didn't know where it was. Uh, the quotation was to this effect that uh, there was an American statesman. I knew that it was an American statesman that said it because that's what impressed me. What he said, and I, I believe it was like from a century or so ago, I mean the 19th century and 20th century statesmen don't talk this way, but the older ones they do. Anyhow, they, uh, he said <clears throat> the noblest thought that he had ever entertained was that God shall judge every man according to his works. That was the noblest thought that he'd ever thought of, you know, and that was an American, not, this was not a religious person, this was an American statesman, and I, I couldn't find it on the internet, but I found it through a Brother Seth Wilson today. I asked him about it, and he says it was Daniel Webster, and that's what I thought. It was a Webster, I remember it was a Webster, but anyhow, what it, for whatever it's worth, that uh, there have been men that have thought about this and pondered this, and... Uh, this is a very intriguing uh, thought to consider that God will judge every man according to his works. I'd also like to give a definition of glory. It kind of uh, hinges on what Brother Aaron just said. He, uh, I, I'm not copying what he said, but I, I would already thought about this. But, but glory, uh, <clears throat> God's glory has to do with wherever God manifests himself. You know, whether it's his grace or his mercy or his wrath or his... His goodness or his love, see, his, 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 any aspect of God's person is not, you can't, it's not bland. It's not ho-hum. You know, you can't, you can't, like, turn aside from it. You've got to, you, it will make you sit up and take notice. See, it's, it's of that nature. See, it's, I mean, if you're, if for, we're talking about people that are perceptive. See, people that are, have, living by faith, you know, it, it, this is the way any aspect of God's person See, there are no aspects of God's person that are not glorious. See, he's a, he is the God of glory. Now, what I'm going to do here is uh, I'm going to, we're going to start out with my text. 
and I'm going to tantalize you a little bit, and then I'm going to come back and deal with it a little bit later, okay? So we're in the text here is, uh, this is found in Romans chapter 2, and uh, the, 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 te- the words that I really want to focus on are uh, verse, verses 7 uh, through uh, 7 through Seven and eight, I guess. But anyhow, this is, this is how it goes. But after thy hardness and impenitent heart, treasurest up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. Oh, that's an intriguing thought in itself. The revelation of the righteous judgment of God. This is the, we want this to become a part of our spiritual vocabulary, see? The righteous, the revelation of the righteous judgment of God. Amen. Who will, now here's this, here's this phrase. Now this, this phrase is found all through the scriptures. Who will render to every man according to his deeds. Now, and the part we're going to focus on is... Uh, to them who by patient continuance and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. Now, I'm, I'm going to, um, of course, the opposite is true. Now, people that aren't seeking after these things and are the ones that are contentious. So you don't, and we'll, we'll deal with that later. People that are contentious, well, we will, I'm going to urge you not to be contentious in this sense. See, that's, that's, that's going to be, uh, we're, we'll deal with that uh, in, in just a few moments. But anyhow, had you ever thought, now here, the, uh, the procurement or the obtainment of eternal life is based on something that you do. Now I'll just tell you, that goes counter to a lot of theologies. I'll tell you, there's a lot of theologies that uh, in the, a foot in the United States and in, even in the various parts of the world that would say, oh, we're not saved by works, we're saved by grace. You know? But see, men have such a, a surface view of the things of God that they're not able to see what he's talking about here. See, now this, this is, but this is the Apostle Paul. Now, if you, if you, uh, if you think that maybe I'm, I'm taking the text out of context, I'm going to tell you so another place where, where an apostle says the same thing. Remember, he said, he says, the world passes away. The world is passing away. This is in 1 John chapter 2. And the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. How's that? Eternal life, content, just by doing the will of God. How's that? Now here's something there. there eternal life is hinged on something that you do. Now I'll just tell you right now, we, of course we have to interpret what we mean by, by uh, you know, the, uh, this matter of, of uh, doing the will of God. We've got to interpret what we mean by that. See, well, I mean, that's uh, obviously we're not coming up we're not coming up Mount Zion by a system of law. That's not what we're saying. But, and we'll, we will interpret that as we go along. But that is an intriguing thought, that, that we seek after glory. We're actually seeking after glory and honor and immortality. And, uh, and I, we, that's, that's something that I want to, uh, that I, we'll come back to that and, and we'll deal with that in a moment. Now, let's, let's look at a couple other texts of Scripture that have to do with this uh, subject. And the, one of them is from a, this prayer of Hannah in uh, 1 Samuel uh, chapter 2 and verse 3. I'll tell you, that's, you know, you talk about uh, women keeping silence in the church. I'll tell you, you don't want to shut up this woman because she really had something to say. Matter of fact, she had something to say a lot more profound than a lot of men that I've heard. You read that whole section, you know, I'm, I'm serious. You see, let's talk, let's just read through there what Hannah's, what H- Hannah's prayer. This, this came from her heart. I'll tell you, there's some pretty profound things that she says there. But anyhow, she says, Talk no more exceeding proudly. Let not arrogance come out of your mouth, for the Lord is a God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. Now that's what, what I want to focus on is by him actions are weighed. I want you to, so I want us to see that, you know, when, when we talk about God judging men according to their works, 
See now, now the very let, let's just look at this. Look at it this way. If if God could judge men by the book, I mean, if it was just everything was codified, and we were going to, if He could just say, well, you violated, you know, such and such a precept in the day of judgment. I mean, you know, like number one or or number 153, if you violated that one, then you get this kind of a sentence, right? Or you get this kind of a, a reward, whatever it is. See, but no, see, there's, there's more involved on the, in the day of judgment and when God judges men. See, otherwise you wouldn't really need a judge. Yes, see, now remember Jesus in John chapter 5, see, the, the, the Lord, the Father has committed all judgment unto the Son because he's the Son of Man. See, now, we wanna, you want to give thanks that Amen. judgment has been committed to somebody who knows who we are. I mean, he really knows who we are. This one who was touched uh, by the, the feeling of our infirmities, and he was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. That's the one that God has appointed to be our judge. See, so he, he's, he's been through these waters of trouble that we're passing through now. He's been through it, except he didn't sin. See, now that's the only, that's the only difference, that Jesus didn't sin, but he's, he was faced with the same temptations that you and I are, except he did it without sin. Now, let's just, uh, just by, uh, to illustrate this, I want to just show you how, for example, there's, here, here's three examples. Now, let's just take Sarah. Uh, Brother Aaron uh, mentioned her, uh, Abraham's wife. And then let's go up to uh, Elizabeth and uh, that's her, her husband who's, uh, no, up in the, uh, Elizabeth and um, um, who's the, uh, Zacharias, thank you, uh, Zacharias. And then we've got Mary, the mother of our Lord. So now we've got, actually we've got three different, uh, we've got three different scenarios here where the same issue has surfacing this matter of a uh, of a birth of a, a miraculous birth right it was in the case of in the case of sarah mm -hmm. in the case of sarah she was she was not able to have children and even up on the t until until her the that age uh, i believe it was 75 or 80 that she attained when she finally had isaac uh, see she was she was barren up until that time but remember she laughed in the tent now here and so, now what I want you to see here is that how that God, now this is how this matter by, by him actions are weighed. In the, in the case of, uh, of Sarah, uh, Sarah denied that she laughed, right? She says, no, I didn't laugh. And, but the Lord said, yes, you did laugh. Nay, but thou didst laugh. That's King James Version, okay? Now in the case of uh, Zechariah, Zechariah, it was the same thing. Now, uh, his, his wife, Elizabeth, was barren too, right? But he was going to, she was going to uh, bring forth uh, John the Baptist, right? And uh, so, Zechariah just asked the question, now, how, how, shall, these, how, how shall these things be? How, how can this possibly happen since, you know, my, my wife and I are both, uh, uh, you know, up in the years, and my wife's barren and not unable to have children, and and so the, Gabriel says, well, you're going to be dumb. He's going to, you're, you're not going to be able to speak until the time when, uh, when, the, when John is born. And then in the case of Mary, the mother of our Lord, she said, when Gabriel approached her about the matter, she said, how shall these things be, seeing I know not a man? And the Lord didn't rebuke her at all. See, now, that we, in this case, it was a, this was a valid consideration. So we've got the, we've got a, it's a moral issue that's at stake here, right? So this is, in the case of Mary, it's a, it, this is a valid consideration. So, so the, the Lord, uh, so the Lord the, uh, Gabriel just, he just, he said, well, the, the power of the, of the highest is going to overshadow you. And, and so he explained how this was going to happen. See? But in the case of Zechariah, now Zechariah should have known from these cases back in, the law, in, in, in Moses and the prophets like Sarah, and Manoah, and some of these other ones where this, where this sort of thing had happened, see, he should have, he should have known that. He was, a, he, was one of, he was a priest. He should have known that, see, and he, he should have been, he should have reasoned, God, in other words, God expected him to reason upon what was revealed, see, and so, and, but nevertheless, the, uh, 
what the uh, what was meted out to Zechariah was not really it wasn't brutal you would say but nevertheless it was you know it got the point across you know what I'm saying it got this was uh, it got the point across so he knew that uh, that this uh, this well it gave him something to think about Now let's, in the same, uh, from the same perspective, there are degrees of heart involvement for good and evil. There are actions which proceed from faith in God, and there are those which proceed from unbelief. See, all, that, all, of the act, all actions actually proceed from the heart, right? So Jesus said, out of the heart come all these things. Remember, he said that in the Gospel accounts. And so, uh, so actions proceed from the heart, whether the heart is is a heart of faith or whether it's unbelief, you know, that depends on the individual. But let's think, for example, of the parable of the sheep and the goats. From, from all outward appearance, both the sheep and the goats had done similar things. The sheep had forgotten that they had done them, and the goats took issue with the Lord when he charged them with neglect. How about that? On the same issue. And... So faith produces works which the doer of them often forgets because his works are a thank offering for the great mercy and grace which God has bestowed upon him. See, so actually, see, that's the, this is the way, you know, people that are living by faith, <clears throat> actually, when, and see, I'm kind of working into the text in Romans chapter 2, but I want you to see that faith and works, I know this is a big, uh, and there's some, in some sectors of the, of the church world that this there's a lot of hassling and and uh, you know there's some people that don't think that uh, Paul and James could actually sit down at the same table and have a friendly conversation at least that's the way you know what I'm saying that's at least that's the implications that you get from them anyhow but I'll tell you that they they certainly could and they certainly would and they certainly have Whatever the record-keeping goats were doing, they were not doing it unto Jesus. In other words, their actions did not proceed from faith in Christ, so they didn't count. Their actions did not proceed from faith in Christ, so they were handicapped in not perceiving who, who Christ's brethren even really were. See, they, they, they evidently were ministering to a lot of people, but they were ministering to the wrong people. See, uh, so, see so faith... So here's another... Uh, Here's another uh, thing that faith does. It, it actually makes you aware of who Christ's brethren actually are. Right. You know, see, I'm talk we're talking about people that have a, a relish for the things of God. We're talking about those kind of people, people that, that love the things of God, and they love to, they love to talk about Jesus and, and the great salvation which, which God has accomplished uh, through him, see? And they, they love that, see? And those kind of people, see? But faith makes you... Uh, Makes you, it brings you into a state of awareness of who these people are. And before faith came, see, these people were just kind of strange, right? They were just, uh, we just didn't, we couldn't quite figure them out. You know, we weren't sure what made them tick. Now, let's go on to another text. Uh, this is in uh, Psalm 62. This is one that you'll all remember. Remember he said, God has spoken once, but twice have I heard this, that power belongeth unto God. But that's not where he stopped. He says, he says, also unto thee, O Lord, belongeth mercy, for thou renderest to every man according to his works. See how thou, now here it's, now, David, he, David perceived that it was the, the rendering according to his works was even more on the mercy side than on the power side. See, now, the, now see, now, the, uh, this matter of God's power and his mercy, see, this, is, uh, this, this dual aspect of God you see um, uh, elsewhere in Scripture, you know, like work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God that worketh in you both to will and to do of his own good pleasure, right? So there you've got the power and you've got the mercy. So you've got God working with you, but yet we don't want to, let's not be toying around. See, this is nothing to mess around with. 
But nevertheless, God is very gracious and merciful. But, you know, this is, uh, salvation is nothing to be toyed with. And I think of uh, where uh, Moses said in Psalm 90, who knoweth the power of thine anger? And at, remember at Mount Sinai, the, uh, <clears throat> this was in Habakkuk. Uh, remember it's in Habakkuk chapter 3 and verse 4, it said that this was the hiding of God's power when God shook Mount Sinai. See, that was, the, that was just the hiding of his power. Now David perceived that both mercy and power belonged unto God, and it is essential that for men by faith to rightly understand both of these aspects of God's nature, if they are be to begin to understand him at all. God is too great and glorious to creedalize and institutionalize. Actually, actually, your heart if you have a, a soft heart, a heart of flesh, as the prophets talked about, actually that's able to hold a lot more than a creed. Did you ever think about that? Amen. Or an institution, see? Institution, just, it's just, it, it just breaks up. It's not able to, it's not able to hold it. See, you see the, the, the things of God have to be held by something that's flexible. and I mean, not flexible in the sense of compromise, but, but something that's tender and something that's soft, like the heart, which God has put inside man. Mm -hmm. Amen. Now he says here, thou renderest to every man according to his work. There could be no talk about mercy apart from the prospect of, a, of the coming Redeemer, the Lord Jesus Christ. And this has been uh, touched on before. You know, all the talk, all the mentionings of mercy and forgiveness back in Moses and the prophets, see, this was all looking ahead to the coming sin bearer. See, God was See, God knew what he was going to do at the cross. See, this was all, it was, everything was spoken in view of that. See, God, not even God can forgive sin without a sin bearer. That's, that's something that not even God can do. He can't. He cannot deny himself, see. And incidentally, that's one of the, that's, this is one of the things where the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, see, it's, this is consistent with reason, if you think about it. See, now here you, we've got... We, we all know that we're in a situation where we've got sin. All, all you have to do is to take inventory in your own heart, and you, and you see that uh, there's quite, quite frankly, there's, uh, there's, it's not very pretty. And quite frankly, we wouldn't want it put up on a billboard, right? And, uh, and, uh, but nevertheless, uh, nevertheless, God is uh, he's merciful because, because of, the, of the Redeemer that he was sending. God rendering to every man according to work. This is a rare but valid association, not for those who are contentious, but for those who obey the truth. Now here, I want you to think about this. This is something, and this, is, uh, this, is, uh, uh, this is glorifies the, this matter of justification by faith, which, uh, which is the theme of the book of Romans, as someone else has already mentioned earlier in the, in the renewal. But I want you to think for a minute about the thief on the cross in this connection. Much of his adult life, so far as we know, was given to stealing and possibly robbing clear and specific violations of one of God's commandments. And yet, what is this thief remembered most for? What did the Holy Spirit record regarding him? Did the, now, I mean, you know the Holy Spirit, know, he knows all, the Spirit knows all things. He knows all things. Now he could have he could have given us a list of, you know, of what, uh, you know, what the thief did on the west side of Jerusalem on such and such a date, and you know who he harmed and who who he robbed and things like that. He could have done that, but you know, what the what the Holy Spirit records. See now, this is glorifying. Now this you want to see now. This is what God is. This is what God. This is what God wants you to think about. Just now, think about this. Now we think about we talk about the thief, the thief on the cross. Now thief normally, you know thieves under normal circumstances shall not inherit the kingdom of God, right? I mean that's the, that's but, but now this thief, this thief, see now actually, he, he, see his, it's, he's been sanctified. 
not, not, his, not, not his thievery. Now, we're not, we're not justifying his thievery, but, but just when I'm talking about now the, the way the Holy Spirit wrote him up. Yeah. See, you got, you, we've got to see that uh, when the Lord writes up the people, see, now he, he writes up the people, and now here he wrote up the, the, this thief on the cross, and I'll tell you, we don't know a single thing that he stole. We do not know a single thing that he stole. All we know is about a conversation that he had with Jesus. And we know about, so I'm, I, and I, actually I've got this, uh, I just want to go through this step by step. This is what actually took place. Matthew 27, 38 and Luke 23, 32. He and another thief were crucified together with Jesus. Matthew 27, 44. He originally railed on Jesus along with the other thief. And then Luke 23, 39, then only the other thief was railing on Jesus. And then there came a change. The repentant thief rebuked the other thief for his unreasonableness in railing on Jesus. He rebuked him. He says, we're in the same condemnation. What are you, why are you talking this way? And then he asked, the Lord to remember him when he would come into his kingdom. Now, how do you, how do you suppose he, what, what was he talking about? You know, he was, uh, it's, now it's, it's evident the Lord here is hanging, he's hanging on the cross, and it, it's pretty evident that he's not in his kingdom right now. And I'll tell you, it takes some faith to know that somebody that's hanging on a cross even has a kingdom, right? I mean, you would have to, you would have to it would take some faith and some, some spiritual, sanctified consideration to even come to that conclusion that somebody like that even had a kingdom. But, but see, he came to the right con conclusion. See, he was observing the things that were going on around the cross, on the foot of the cross there and all about there, and, and he's, no doubt he saw that title above the, uh, above the thief that said, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. See, and that, uh, there, that, that, uh, well, it is very, it's very well, that probably was what uh, made him think about uh, the Lord uh, being, having a kingdom and asking to come into his kingdom. And then, in Luke 23, 43, the Lord then assured him that that same day he would be with him in paradise. Now that's what the Holy Spirit, how the Holy Spirit wrote up a thief. Now, see, we're, we're not justifying thievery. Don't misunderstand me. I'm saying that all of us, if you, if you want to take inventory in your hearts, you'll, uh, you can find some things there that, uh, that are not real pleasant, right? And they're black. And, and they're, not, they're things that you wouldn't want to, to talk about or want, you wouldn't want uh, other people to talk about or know about, right? There's just things that are there, right? They're, they're, they're things that are part of our, the part of us that we got from Adam. But nevertheless, that's, this, is how the, this is how the Holy Spirit wrote up this thief. Now think about, uh, here's another example. What about Rahab the harlot? How about that? Now here's, when, when we, whenever I talk about her, I talk about Rahab the harlot, see? But normal, and we certainly don't condone harlotry, God forbid. We're, I mean, that's, harlotry is a, I mean, that's a sickening thing to even think about when you think about the actual sin of harlotry. But, but see now, this woman... She is, she been, she's justified. And so, and so as an identifier, we're, you know, the scripture as an identifier refers to her as Rahab the harlot, right? And, and also the thief as the thief on the cross, right? We, well, that's the way we talk about him anyhow. Now, regarding this thief, I want you to see that God is, uh, this is, we, we're, we're not really, uh, if we don't make the application to ourself, regarding the manner of justification and the how God justifies men and how God is able to justify men. I mean, if he can justify a thief hanging on a cross, certainly he can justify you and me wherever we're hanging, right, or wherever we are. Wherever we're sitting or wherever we're standing or wherever we're hanging, he can justify you and I, you and myself in, 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 that, in that manner. 
And the works of this dying thief do follow him as he has been used of God to minister hope and grace to countless individuals down through the centuries. Well, let's, go, let's, let's move on. Let's see here. In Job 34 and verse 11, I just had to eliminate a lot of things because there's, they're actually, if you take out your concordance, you'll see that the, the scriptures are just full of this, this language of God uh, justifying or rendering to men according to their works and according to their ways. It's, it's just all over the scriptures, see? So I, I'm just going to focus on a few of them, and I'll, you can look the rest up yourself. But here, uh, this is, uh, these are the words of Elihu. Elihu in the book of Job, remember, he was the one that rebuked Job, and he rebuked Job's three friends, you know, at the end, after they were, everybody was done talking. Then Elihu came, and he said, now, uh, you know, now it's my turn. I've got some things to say, and uh, so anyhow, there is a precise correspondence between man's work and a divine payback to every man. Now, if you're perceptive, See, you can even see this in this life. See, this is, uh, you, don't, you don't have to necessarily wait till the day of judgment to see the fullness of this. You know, some, some men's sins are going before into judgment, and other men's sins, they, they cannot be hit, right? I mean, so, but anyhow, you, there, but see, God, he's, God is giving to every man a payback, whether it be for good or, or for, for evil, see? To find implies that reasonable men, at least, are able to perceive the correspondence between the manner in which they are living and the recompense that God is giving, even in the present time. For example, in, in Psalm 18, 26, with the pure thou wilt show thyself pure, and with the froward thou wilt show thyself froward. And uh, Proverbs 3, 34, remember it says, uh, surely he scorneth the scorners, but he giveth grace to the lowly. Well, let's, let's go back to the, the Romans text. There's so many things here that... Uh, anyhow, let's talk about uh, God's goodness, his infinite kindness, his forbearance. His bearing with, having patience with, and putting up with, and tolerating sin. <clears throat> his long-suffering, his patient endurance, and provocation in, or trial. And uh, Brother Kenny Smith uh, one time uh, defined uh, God's long-suffering as him tarrying long with injury. See, God is... Uh, God, God when, when men sin, you know, he, God feels it. I mean, speaking as a man, he, see, God is affected when men sin. See, it, it hurts him. See, the, the long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah. Remember that. Now, there comes a point in time when it's said of those who did not believe that they could not believe. And uh, this, this is something that we have to learn about uh, God's, our God, that uh, people that toy around with, with God, see, there, and unbelief, and, you know, playing around with, uh, you know, not putting off their uh, coming to him for salvation, see, there, there comes a point when, they, when God will seal them in that uh, in that state of unbelief, see, and of course we don't know wherever that is, and we don't want to know, but that we want to, we're just saying that that's the way God is. And uh, <clears throat> this matter of impenitence, he says, thy impenitent heart, having no contrition or sorrow for sin, unrepentant, obdurate, stubborn, the op opposite of being crushed or broken in the sense of, uh, in the spirit by a sense of sin, and so brought to complete uh, pe penitence. Now, I say these things to, say, to underscore the fact that, imp, that impenitence is universally relevant. 
And what I mean by this is, see, now, we were, uh, let, me just, let me just say this uh, by some, remember he said in Isaiah 53 in verse 6, that all we like sheep have gone astray, and we've turned every one to his own way, and then in, uh, in Romans chapter 5, remember, he said, by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. See, there's a sense in which our sinnerhood is stemming from Adam. Uh, one of the other brethren um, made that distinction earlier, in the, uh, earlier this day. I don't remember who it was. But, but there is a sense in which there is this new dimension when we think about, see, it, when you think about your being a sinner, you, uh, we, we actually, by one man's disobedience, Adam, many were made sinners. Even so, though, by the, the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. See, the, the opposite is true, too. That's the, that's the glorious gospel message, see. The day of judgment will not be a day of evaluation nor of determination, but rather of revelation, the revelation of the righteous judgment of God. Okay, I'm just going to move on here because uh, this matter of uh, this patient continuance, just bear with me. Uh, by patient continuance, we seek after glory and honor and immortality. See, by patient continuance. Now, let's look at it this way. If men, if men seek after glory and immort honor and immortality, apart from, this, from, apart from living by faith, see, they'll, they'll, they'll quench the spirit or they'll grieve the spirit. See, you'll, you'll actually, if you, if you seek after these things, apart from the, the way, the, the means that God has appointed, you'll actually quench the spirit. See, you'll actually, you'll find yourself out, moved out, moved out away from the presence of God. Yes, I'm going to, um, this matter of patient continuance, uh, continuing in Christ's love, <clears throat> continuing in the grace of God, continuing in the faith, Continuing in God's goodness, continuing in watchfulness, and in the apostles' doctrine, continuing in the perfect law of liberty, this, uh, and continuing in the Father and the Son, this well-doing is doing that proceeds from believing. See, that's, uh, that's the connection. That's what you want to see, that, that by patient continuance and well-doing, see, this is, this is all, we're, our, the thrust of our hearts is to be is to be in the direction of believing. We believe the record that God has given of his son and see that the works flow out of that. See, the works flow out of that. It proceeds from that, see? Amen. And it's by doing that that we're seeking after glory and honor and immortality. Now the desire for these things is unmistakably written in the human constitution. Glory and honor and immortality. And fallen men still seek after what appears to be glory, but that glory is swiftly passing away. And he seeks after an honor that begins to fade as soon as it is bestowed or ob obtained. And he seeks after an immortality that is, has left a delusive shadow in the morass of fallen sinful humanity. You think of like health clubs and, and uh, health foods and skyrocketing metal, medical costs that people are willing to to pay and you know and just uh, and just recent this past week I read on the internet there was this there's a British uh, scientist who is uh, he's he's determined that he can that they can come up with a way to uh, reverse the aging process well he's just wrong you know he's uh, we just tell him that uh, even though we're not uh, brilliant and and like he is we'll uh, we'll just tell him that quite frankly you're wrong you know and uh, just uh, you'll just have to wait and see Despite all the misery, frustration, and disappointment that characterizes the life that now is because of sin, God has nevertheless left a witness to the, pres the preciousness of life in some of its most essential elements. 
causing a universal desire for its continuance and unendingness. You see this, you know, people, you know, even unregenerated people, they're not, they're not willing to give, give it up. They just, they just want to keep cleaving, whatever it takes, we just keep moving on, we just keep, keep the life process going, whatever it takes, you know, that's, but this is a, but see, but this is a witness that's, that's been left in, you know, uh, that God, is, God has left this witness there. Now, they're, they're, they're seeking it by the wrong means, but, uh, but nevertheless, men seek after these things. A curtain of forgetfulness often hides from man's memory the troubles, the woes, and the heartaches, and the afflictions which are also associated with these lowlands of sin and separation from the Most High. Now, we said before that uh, if believing men are occasionally tempted to, with obsession with these things in the present time, they will quench and eventually grieve the Holy Spirit in their quest for their for fulfillment in this world. And, you know, I just say it this way. The Holy Spirit is the unobtrusive member of the Godhead. In other words, he doesn't, the Holy Spirit never draws attention to himself. Remember, Jesus said, he shall take of mine, and he shall show it unto you. See, the Holy Spirit never, that, that's the manner of, of the Holy Spirit. He doesn't, he doesn't draw attention to himself. See, now, when he's in you, he won't draw attention to himself either. And he will, and, and you won't draw attention to yourself when you're walking in the Spirit either. That's the point that we want to make here. Well, this matter of uh, seeking after immortality, I just want to, uh, when, I, when I was uh, teaching, started out teaching uh, years ago, I left and went into the business world and now I've come back, but, but when, I, when, I've, when I started out teaching, I was in a, in a teacher's meeting once and the, uh, the principal there, he was, uh, he's kind of uh, haughty in his uh, thoughts, and, uh, but anyhow, he was, uh, he was saying, who knows uh, what uh, medical science might, you know, what achievements we might come by with medical science, and who knows, maybe we'll even achieve immortality. And this, so, so this, uh, this teacher in the background, in the back over here, this old, uh, elderly lady, she says, oh, I hope not. But see, the <laughs> Well, anyhow, the thoughts that I want to, to leave with you are that these, uh, that God will render to every man according to his works, and he will do this to those who by patient continuance and well-doing seek after glory and honor and immortality. See, we actually are seeking after these things. We do value these things. Even though the Lord said, uh, remember he said through the prophet Isaiah, he says, my glory will I not give to another. But see, he is going to give it to us in the Lord Jesus Christ. See, he's, he just had to have the proper vessels to bestow the glory on, see. So, so uh, anyhow, by patient continuance and well-doing, we're seeking after glory and honor and immortality. And, so I can, and to those that do this, God is going to give eternal life. So I'll leave those thoughts with you.